Good afternoon. Hello, class. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Hope all of you are good. Yeah, welcome, sir. Yeah, we are good, and you. Very good. That's him, sir. Where are the rest? Stephen Amoku. Stephen Amoku. Amoku Stephen. There is no joint soon. Oh, what? Oh, this is. There is no joint soon. What? Where is Stephen Amoku? Okay, so let's wait a few minutes, like about five minutes more, five minutes more whilst we wait for the rest of our people to join. Um, today's topic today's topic is on budgeting one of the most interesting topics that you need to you need to grasp and if you grasp the principles it's going to be very good for your business life even your personal life So those who are on board, you can announce to your colleagues that lecture is in session, so they have to join the platform. I've already sent the, the meeting link. Uh, I can, I can, I can. Please, you can um, mute your microphone and your your camera just to improve the connectivity. If you have your your video on and your audio on the disturb belinda belinda and lucia your cameras are on belinda belinda your camera is on when you put your camera off, it will improve the traffic situation. The teacher, your hand is up. If you have anything to say, you can say. Leticia, to four, your hand was up. You have something. No, no, please. No. Okay. Belinda. Belinda Ankara.
Belinda. Okay, so if you're not talking, you put your your microphone also off so that you do not disturb the class with any background noise. Lucia Blankson, your mic is on. You can put it off, please. Lucia Blankson. Lucia. Okay, so let's get to our topic. We are going to discuss budgeting. In fact, budgeting is a very extensive topic. Um, but for, for the examination purposes, we may be concentrating on only some aspects, aspects that I think are very salient. It does not mean that your learning as a student should be confined to these areas I'll select and teach. You have the textbook. The areas I will not teach will be the non-technical areas that you can just read and understand, all right? OK. So let's begin the whole business of today's lecture by asking a few questions. All of you have done some budgeting before. You do budgeting every day, whether you are aware you are doing it or you are not aware. You do budgeting every day. Uh, when you were thinking of, um, OK, so um, how much do I have to get for my books, my hair, my dress, and those things so that I can live well on campus? All of those things are a form of budgeting, even though you may do them in your mind. That's what budgeting is. And budgeting has been with the human race for as long as humans have existed. We have always been doing some form of budgeting. So let's first of all ask, what is budgeting for you? How do you understand the word budgeting? Say just what you are, how you understand it, what you think about it. What's budgeting? When we say budgeting, what 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 does it mean to you? There's a question to the class, please. Class, I'm asking you a question. Dennis. Dennis Akins. Okay, someone wants to talk. Rhoda. Yeah, Janet, your hand is up. Janet Strickle, your hand is up. Janet. Say this is this is Kingsley. Kingsley. This is Kingsley. Kingsley. Yes, I'm using Janet's phone. You are using Janet's number. Yes, okay. Sir. Most of so let's, are let's, let's listen to you, Kingsley. Yes, sir. We are listening to you, Kingsley. Yes, sir, I'm saying that most of us, our network is not um, is not good. So we have poor connection where we are. We are in classroom, and the, the, the connection is very poor. Yeah, for so the so connection like, problem. We are using... Um, Connection problem is always an issue here. But we still have to do something whilst, yeah, even though we have this problem. 
So you just, I understand that there's a connection problem and it, that problem is beyond any one of us. So let's let's do the best we can do. Okay. Yes, so... Um, limited. So maybe two to five people are using one, one thing. I think you are far away from the gadget because we can hardly hear you. So if you can get close to the mouthpiece, so we can hear you well. So the question I asked, let me repeat the question. The question was, what does the word budgeting mean for you? How do you understand it? Just say what it means for you, because everybody has heard the word budgeting before. Everybody has been doing some budgeting every day in his or her life. So what is budgeting? That's where we are starting the lecture from. What is budgeting? Benedicta, Benedicta Edunia, Benedicta. Dennis Ekins. Dennis Ekins. Dennis Osei. Osei, Dennis. Sir, I'm here. Yes, sir. Respond to the question, please. Uh, budgeting is you planning on how to spend your time or money. Okay. You planning on how to spend your time or money. Yes, Janet, your hand is up. Yes, sir. Janet, your hand is up. You can, you can talk. Dennis Akins, your hand is up. You can talk. Yeah, uh, sir, you can see budgeting is the activity of contracting a budget. The attitude of? The activity of constructing a budget. Budgeting. Okay. So let's follow up your definition quickly with this question. What is a budget? I think that's how I should have asked the question. What is a budget? Yes, yeah, so, so for you, Akins. If you if you have something to say about it, what is a budget? Okay, so let's let's put what you have said together and make some headway. We've been doing budgeting every day, and let me show you how. Most of the things we do every day tells us we are doing budgeting. I'm going to read some quotations. In fact, I have put those same quotations in your textbook. Some quotations that reflect the fact that most of the things we do involve budgeting. After reading about two or three of the quotations, we'll try to put the quotations, the message in the quotations together. And then we'll ask ourselves again what budgeting is, because there are some quotations speaking something about budgeting. All right, so I'm reading, let me share. I'm, I'm, I have an electronic version of your book here. So you can see, you can see my screen. You can also have your book by your side and then you go through it. So the introduction of the chapter kind of gives some quotations. One of them was picked from the Bible, and many of you are very uh, good with the Bible. You are students of the Bible, so you know the content. One is from Luke chapter 14, verse 28 to verse 33. And this is what it is written there. For which one of you, desiring to build a tower, or a mansion does not first sit down and count the costs, whether he has enough to complete it. 
Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. Okay, so let's put it there. And then it also gives another, another side to the same issue from the same source, Luke 14, 28, Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able to fight the enemy with 10,000 and if not, while the other is yet a great way of he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Okay, so this is something that I speak from the Bible, and it is saying something about budgeting. So get a message. Let's read two more quotations, and then we have to consolidate them. And someone will summarize what the key message is, which gives us some idea of budgeting, and which, of course, also tells us that throughout the human life, we've been doing budgeting every day. The second quotation is speak from um, a painter, a notable painter called Pablo Picasso. This is what he says. Our goals can only be reached through a vehicle of a plan in which we must fervently believe and upon which we must vigorously act. There is no other route to success. Then let's take maybe the last one. Um, let me pick, take it from Confucius, he's a Chinese philosopher. A man who does not plan long ahead will find trouble at his door. Okay. So when you put these quotations together, what is the central theme that all of them are communicating? Who can summarize the central theme in the quotations we just read? They're all talking about planning. Yeah, Dennis. They're all talking about planning. So if we connect what is inside these quotations to the topic we are treating now, which is budgeting and budgetary control, how would you attempt to define budgeting in your own words? How would you, how would you say budgeting? How would you define budgeting? What would you say budgeting is? Or what would you say a budget is? Let's put it that way. Hannah, sorry. Hannah. I'm sorry, Hannah. Hey. Yes, you are in class. Respond to my question. When, when you put all the quotations together, we get a sense of the central theme. Dennis helped us to understand the central theme. <laughs> About planning, right? Hello. And I'm asking you, based on what we have understood from the quotations, what will you say budget is, Hannah? Can I sorry? Say. Yes, we are listening hey. to you. Say. Hello, say. Yes, Hannah, we are listening. Hello. Okay, it Hannah, is the sum of money. Okay, so I'll say the sum of money allocated for a particular purpose. It is okay, the sum so of money. Allocated for purpose. Okay, so budget is sum of money allocated for a particular purpose. Hello. Okay, thank you, Hannah. So that's what Hannah says. What would you also say? 
about what a budget is. A budget is a finance. Okay, let's listen to Shadrach Bote. So please, a budget is a financial plan that pinpoints how resources can meet our expenses. Okay, good. You, you have all done well. So when we put everything together, we can say that we can say in our own ways, in we can say it in different ways. We can see a budget as as a tool, like he said, a financial tool, which attempts to quantify our future expectations so that we can make preparations towards reaching those aspirations. So first of all, the budget will help you to kind of think ahead of time what, what you want to do, your expectations, your future expectations. Oh, I will need this money for my school fees. I will need this. I will need this. I will need this. I will need this this semester. So through the vehicle of budgeting, you'll be able to quantify. You'll be able to, first of all, identify your expectations. And as a financial tool, we need to reduce the expectations into quantitative data to quantify our expectations. And most importantly, try to think of how we meet those expectations in terms of resources. That's good. That's just what you said, and it is fantastic. All right. So just as budgeting is an everyday thing, and it should be an everyday tool for all of us as individuals, it is even more important for businesses. Because in the business world, competition can be very fearsome, cutthroat competition. Because all the companies, all the companies are doing all that they are doing for only one thing, for the customer's money. And look at the number of companies producing the same thing. If you even take mobile phone, for example, can you count the number of co companies into the production of mobile phones, Samsung, Apple, um, those producing techno, those producing Huawei, and so on and so forth, a lot of them. And all of them want you to buy. So they make their propositions. They make their value propositions. This is what my gadget has. It has this, it has this, come and buy it. They all have it for you to come and buy. And if they can get that opportunity, all of them will wish that they are the ones, they are the only ones in business so that they get all the money for themselves. So they do so many things to gain competitive advantage over the other people. And this kind of competition requires that you have to be a good planner. You have to plan well. Otherwise, you will be seen out of the competition. So most of the companies that you can identify as collapsed or not doing so well, much of it has to do with the power of their planning and therefore budgeting. The whole of the planning process starts from what we call mission vision statements. Through these statements, you see the bigger aspirations of the company. And these bigger aspirations are narrowed down into the annual budgets. And that's what we're going to concentrate on. All right. So there are certain things that you may have to read by yourself. So I'm giving them to you as a reading assignment. And most of them, most of them have to do with just some theories behind uh, budgeting, which you can just lie in your bed and read. So you have to read on you have to read on all the theories in the budget is in the book all of them then today what we are going to do is to pick selected operational budgets and work on them directly. We don't have much time. 
So we'll be talking about how to prepare sales budgets. We will talk about how to prepare production budgets. How to prepare materials. Labor. And lastly, we will look at cash budgets. There are other types of budgets that you will have to know how to prepare them. But you will skip because of time. But you cannot skip. You still have to read them. So labor budget, before cash budget, you can have um, overhead budget. So overhead budget is there, which you can read. Overhead budget. Once you have your materials budget, your labor budget, overhead budget, it means you can even prepare your budgeted income statement. You can prepare your budgeted statement of financial position. And there is also what we call capital budget. Capital budget. Right. So we will, for this particular exam, we will talk about cash budget. I'll talk about sales budget, production budget, and materials budget. Labor budget is very simple for you to do. I'll talk about it, but our concentration will be more on sales, production, materials, and then cash budgets. More, 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 more on the cash budget. More, more, more on the cash budget. Cash budget is more likely to be examined than any of the other budget components I have told you. All right, okay, so let's talk about sales budget. Now we have understood what a budget is. A budget is a planning tool which quantifies what we desire for the future. And it also has information on resource allocation to meet these future desires. So every organization will desire to make sales. In fact, that's what they, they set themselves out to do, make money. And you make money, first of all, through selling either services or products. All right, so um, the organization will sit down to come up with some figures that they expect as sales values for the next period, next year, next two years, next three years, and so on and so forth. Next month, next two months, next three months, and so on and so forth. Next quarter, next two quarters, next three quarters, and so on and so forth. How do they do the sales budgeting? We said these are all expectations, but they have to be guided expectations. So before the, the company will say that, okay, these are our budgeted sales values. Budgeted sales volumes for, let's say, month one, month two, month three, month four, and so on and so forth. 
what 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 will go into the determination of these budgeted sales figures what will go into the determination will they just be lying on their bed and they say okay i think january we have to pick 2000 units and february we have to pick uh, 3000 march 4000 no they can't just be doing it like that it needs to be informed the decision that we should expect sales volume of 3000 in january is guided by certain things what do you think will kind of guide companies to come up with their sales uh, expectations it's a question to the class please Ruda. Ruda course rep. Hello, Ruda. Yes, sir. Ruda, the question is for you. Please, the question again. Hey. So you are not listening to what, all that I'm saying. Are you doing I'm something listening. else? Are you have you just logged in and doing something else? No, please. Like I'm on campus, so there's nice around. Okay. So the question is that we're talking about we're talking about sales budget. The company need to come up with <laughs> sorry. Their expectation of sales volumes for the next periods. And before they say that, okay, next year, or let's say next month, we expect sales quantity of 1,000. Next two months, 2,000. Next three months, 3,000. Something should be informing their determination of those values. Because they just, they can't dream to get those values. And they, they cannot just write any figures. They have to get some solid basis for coming up with more realistic sales expectations what are some of the things they will be considering to come up with sales uh sales figures yeah past sales okay their past sales okay. so how how will the past sales help them M make a complete statement about that what you said is correct but explain how past sales is a good guide to what they should expect in the next period so that means they are going to, they are going to use their past sales to focus in the future so the things that they the sales that they'll make in the future their past sales will use like it will guide them to focus on it good so things that have been happening in the past so if you can get a trend let's say for the past five or even more for the past ten five years if you study the patterns of the sales, that can give you a good picture about what the next periods are likely to be. So good, past future, sorry, past sales data. But the past sales data alone will not be enough. So what will also be added to the past sales data to, to streamline the, the determination of the sales values? Sandy? Sandy, Sandy, is it Sandy Kitty? Sandy, Sandy, is Sandy in class? Absent. Siswana Chemenu. Siswana. Augustina Kong. Augustina. Yes, sir. Yeah, Augustina, respond to the question. Okay, sir, can it, okay, can it be maybe future records or history? 
Come again, Augustina. Okay, future records or present. So future records like like what? I hope you understand the question, Augustina. Do you do you understand the question? I said you said the what the sales in budgeted sales volume. No, it means you're not paying attention. I said that before the company will come up with the figures that okay, this is what we expect. This is what our expectations are for future sales. They will be guided by certain things. They don't they will not just go and dream and get the figures. Or they cannot just write figures from their mind, just like that. So we're looking for the factors that will be will be a guidance to the determination of their sales values. And Rhoda said their past sales records is a good guide in determining what they should expect as sales figures for the future. And which is very correct. And we said the past sales records is good, but that will not be complete. Certain things need to be added. So we are looking for those certain things that will be added to the past sales records to, to help in determining our future sales expectations. So that's the question, Augustina. Now you can talk. Okay, ledger, ledger book, ledger books, ledger books. Yes, sir. Okay, so that's what Augustina thinks. What do you also think? What do you think? Abigail, come in. Abigail. Abigail, come in. Yes, sir. Abigail, respond to the question. Yeah, Abby, we are listening to you. Abigail, come in. We are listening to you. Vera Darko. Vera. Okay, so yeah, Rhoda. Rhoda, your hand was up. Okay, yeah, Rhoda, we are listening. I want to talk. So could it be that you'll be using the qualitative or quantitative techniques to with the, with the, as well as the sales to focus the, the sales? Yeah, they will be employing, they will be doing some calculations. For example, when they Hello, pick, sir. Yeah. Sir. Hello, talk, please, I'm listening. I think it's, it's a network issue. So please, I'm saying that could it be that you are using the qualitative or the quantitative methods? The quantitative says as the expression and the, to do the calculations. Yes, and I was explaining it this way. From what Rhoda said earlier, that the determination of future sales Hello, sir. can be informed by past sales records. 
they will use something like forecasting methods to 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 understand the trend in the past sales and then based on that so they can have a predictive model like we, we did with regression and with the high low method so studying the past sales data they can come up with a predictive model to say that okay based on uh, what is happening in the past this is what we should expect for the future so it is still what you said is still about the past sales data. So what they can add, some of the factors they will consider in addition to past sales data is how the economy generally is currently doing. Is the economy booming or the economy is stagnant? What are the general conditions in the economy? Are we experiencing doom so doom so every here and there? Is the economy generally down? Because all of these things impact on sales and therefore your expectations for future sales. If, for example, um, the, the, your product, the patronage of which requires uh, a lot of electricity, Maybe people will need electricity to process your product further for what they need it for. And then the economy is generally experiencing doom so everywhere and there. Just how the economy, what is happening in the economy, just that thing that is happening will disturb your sales. Even if your past sales records show very good trend, what is happening currently shows that you cannot expect like it used to happen in the future. So you also have to consider current performance of the general economy. Apart from that, what can you consider again? You can also consider what competitors are doing because what competitors, competitors are doing also impact on your sales expectations. If your competitors are now doing better than you, it means your sales are going to drop and you should factor that thing in your sales expectations. If your comp competitors are also not doing too well, it's an advantage for you to get more sales for your products. So these are some of the things that will be considered for the organization to come up with the expected sales figures for the next period. And that is the main basis for the sales budget, right? So if you go to, I mean, let's pick something from your textbook. Okay, so the sales budget is here. So the sales budget is very simple to prepare. After they have gone through all those exercises, much of which requires judgment, but of course professional judgment, past sales trend, what is currently happening, competitors' activities, so many other things put together and then we say, okay, we anticipate that sales units, projected sales units, will be um, maybe for product A, 1,000, product B, 1,000 to product C, 1,000, a total of 3,200. The budget can also be prepared on a period basis. So if you take product A, we can have a budget for January, February, March, first quarter. It can also be on that periodic basis. But for this one, which is on product basis, this is just the sales unit estimation. Then the sales unit estimation multiplied by the expected selling price per unit just gives you the sales revenue, which is the sales budget. So for this particular company, they estimated based on professional judgment that uh, sales expectation for product A is 1,000, B is 1,000, to C is 1,000. Price per unit for A is 10 cities, B 8 cities, 50 pesos, C 12 cities. 
Then the sales budget in revenue is 10,000 for A, 10,200 for B, 12,000 for C. So the sales budget is as simple as that. Then when you have your sales estimated and then your sales budget prepared, that tells you or that gives you a picture about how much customers want to demand from you in terms of product for the next period. That's an estimation of that. So once you've gotten that estimation, you will have to produce to meet that expectation, to meet what you think customers require next period. And therefore you need to base on the sales budget, prepare your production budget. How much would you prepare? So what do you think, even before we, 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 go, we, 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 we go into detail, you, you, you have the understanding that the production budget will be based on the sales budget. Because the sales budget is telling us how much customers will demand of the product. And then we have to produce for the customers. So that's how they are linked. So let me ask, I just need a response from the class. Let me ask. What do you think is the basis? What, what, what do you think we should consider? Or what do you think will go into the preparation of the budgets, the production budgets? Yes, Dennis. Dennis, your hand is up. The, the current levels of sales. Current levels, yeah, the current of, levels of sales. Yeah. So the current levels of sales, Sandra, mute your mic if you're not talking. You only put on your microphone when you are giving the nod to talk. Okay, Dennis, I want to comment on Dennis' response. Current levels of sales is a factor that goes to determine the sales expectations. It has nothing to do with the production. So what you said has already gone into the determination of the sales figures. So we are saying that we expect customers to buy 10, 000, sorry, 1,000 units of product A. We expect customers to buy 1,200 units of product B and 1,000 units of product C. Your response has already gone into the determination of these values past levels of sales, current levels of sales, what competitors are doing, what the general economy is doing, and some other factors, all right? But we said that when we have come, we come up with these figures regarding what customers will buy, we need to produce for the customers. So what will go into the production budget now that we have that understanding? Shadrach. Shadrach, so inventory, okay. inventory level. Inventory level. Okay, that's good. How, Shadrach? That's a very good, good response. But how? Step uh, is, uh, for instance, when you uh, you know the sales volume, sales volume or the number of demand that you are getting, you have to know the number of. Uh, uh, Shadrach, can you raise your voice a little? You are far away from your device. Sir, please. I'm saying that with the inventory level well after you you know the number of sales or the demand that you are getting from your consumers you need to know the number of inventory that you will stock in order to produce the goods to match their demands good that's very good that's very good okay uh dennis is your hand still up dennis Dennis, I can see your hand is up. If it is not by mistake, you can talk. If your hand is up by mistake, you can just put your hand down. Okay. So based on what uh, Shadrach said, let me add something. We know that we have to produce this 1,000, 1,200, and 1,000 for the products. 
But based on what Shadrach said, we also have to check that this product A, that we have to produce 1,000, do we already have some of the inventory there? If you already have some of the inventory there, then we may not have to produce the 1,000. We have to produce 1,000 minus what you already have. Same thing applies to all of them. So that's how I understood Shadrach's comment. And that will be that inventory specifically will be closing inventory. How much inventory do we have in our warehouse so that we produce and add it to this to make 1,000? Which is correct. But we still have few things left. I want people to be thinking. So what would you also say? Uh, Shadrach, I'll give you one mark for your response. So you have to remind me. Thank you very much, sir. So what, what do you think has to be said again? Two marks. Two marks available. Sandy Kitty. Say Sandy Kitty said then. Sandy. Tamara. Yeah. Tamara, say yeah. what you think. Yeah, I'm coming. I will say it. You are coming from where? So I'm now thinking. Okay. So I think what is left, let's go back to the model again. This is what we think customers will buy. 1,000. Let's concentrate on only product A. 1,000. And now Shadrach said, this 1,000, we also have to check how much, how many inventory of product A we already have as closing inventory. So we'll subtract that inventory from this 1,000. That should be the amount we have to produce. So this is what he's saying. Let me write. Production budgets. So let's say product A. Product B, C. Sales units. This is what we have estimated to know that to be that customers will buy thousand. Okay, you writing it? I can't see you. You can't it's see. Number. Are you are you showing it? Can you see my screen? Yes, but I can't see what yes, you are writing. Uh, the one who cannot see it's most likely to be from your device, if your device is too small. Try to zoom it from your side because you should be able to see it clearly. Okay. Yeah, try to make adjustment from your device. Okay, fair. Yeah, So, but I'll try to uh, bold in my handwriting. <laughs> Yes, I'm in the I'm in the office having online lecture. Okay, so product A, we expect our our estimation points to the fact that customers will buy one thousand. Product B, our estimation is that customers will buy thousand two hundred units, and product C, they will buy two thousand. That is what our best hey, customers will buy thousand of product C. That's what our professionals have estimated. So, so without any other issue, this is what 
we should be producing because this is what the people will come and buy. But Shadrach said that companies are continuously in business. So it's possible that this is not the first time they are starting the business for them not to have any inventory. So if they are already in business, it's very possible that they will have some closing inventory from the previous period. So if you already have some inventory, then what we should produce should be what we think customers will buy minus what we already have. So if we assume that there is closing inventory of, let's say 200 units, 200 units and 200 units, then what we have to produce No, this will, this will not be closing inventory. This will be opening inventory. It is closing inventory for the previous period, but opening for this period. So opening inventory. Sorry about that. Opening inventory. So if it is January, this is in January, this is the inventory that we began with from the previous period. If this inventory is already there, then we have to produce thousand less 200 so that when we add the 200 so we have to produce 800 which will add to the 200 which is already there to make the thousand which we think customers will come and buy so that's what it is this is thousand and this will be 800 then what we also have to understand is that it is also possible that um, things will not be as strict as we are determining them. In business, what we normally budget, uh, th there could be some shortages or overflows of them. And this is exactly what I mean. We have estimated that customers will buy 1,000. Sometimes the business experiences and boom and then we have or maybe we budgeted a thousand around some customers there are some customers we can gain within the period that we might not have captured in our planning okay and we have to make allowances so that if there is these unexpected sales rise we still can have inventory to meet them otherwise we'll lose such businesses and it will make our business go down eventually. So businesses always do this thing, what they call planned, planned closing inventory. Closing inventory is also referred to as ending inventory. So they will intentionally add some inventory of the goods, anticipating a search in demand above what they anticipated. And when that happens, they still can meet that unexpected rise in demand. So plan closing inventory. So if you have planned that, oh, okay, uh, what can rise, what can come up as an unexpected sales level would be, let's say um, 300 and this 200 and this 100. Then we are going to produce these buffer inventory, those ones that we are adding in anticipation that sales will rise, we have to produce them. So we'll add it to this 200 for product A, add this 200 to 1,000 for product B, add this 100 to 800 for product C. So when we do that, product A will be 800 plus 300, which is 1,100. This will be 1,200, and this will be 900. Okay, so this is what we have to produce. So this is the production budget. That's the quantity, that's the unit we have to produce. So this is the template for the production budget. The sales units as estimated in the sales budget, 
less any opening inventory add planned closing inventory then you get the unit that you have to produce is that okay hello is that okay yes sir right so yes, the framework sir. is in your book with examples okay and when you produce when you finish the production budget the production budget is a budget for the finished product how much also, so if you are doing sobolo for example how much of sobolo bottles that we have to produce so through the production budget we have known that this is how much we think people will buy 1000 and we already have 200 left from previous business. So when we subtract it from the 1,800, and then we plan to add 300 for any unexpected sales rise. So we have to produce 1,100 bottles of Sobolu. What would we use to produce Sobolu? Materials. So you have to prepare your materials budget. And so below, we know they use the hibiscus flowers, they use pineapple and some other materials. So you have to budget for all of these materials that will meet the production of what you have in the production budget. So that's simply what the, uh, the raw materials budget is. So let's see. Very materials budget. It is also similar in preparation to the production budget. The basis of the raw material budget is the production budget. The basis is the production budget. So if we know from the production budget the quantity of the products that we have to produce, then we need to know how much material is required for producing the units. One unit of the finished good, one, one unit of Sobolo bottle one bottle of sobolo that's how i should say it. one bottle of sobolo how what is the quantity of materials it requires if you assume it uses one material let's say pineapple what's the quantity so if the quantity is, is measured in kilograms one bottle of sobolo what quantity what kilograms of pineapple goes into one bottle If we multiply the quantity of pineapples that go into one bottle of Sobolo by the total bottles of Sobolo, then we get the material requirement to meet the production of the Sobolo production budget. But just, just as we said for the finished goods production budget, in terms of opening inventory and closing inventory. The same thing applies to the raw materials budget. It is possible that whatever we will estimate to produce just the production budget, we might have some materials already existing in the warehouse. So we have to Let me show some work. Raw materials budget. So we have units of production. We pick this from the production budget. So let's say product A, B, C. It was this was let's say thousand one hundred. 
this is 1200 this is 900 for example just for example so this is the units we have to produce then material requirements per unit one unit one unit of product a uses let's say 10 kilograms of raw materials this one uses let's say eight kilograms of raw materials and this one uses five kilograms of raw materials when we multiply the kilogram for one unit of the product by the total unit this will give us this is 1100 so this will give us one one so this will give us 11,000. 1,200 times 8, what is the figure? You have to be involved in the discussion. Raymond Papi. Raymond. 1,200 times, times 8, give me the figure. Class, you should be involved in the discussion. 9,600. What? This one. 9,600. Okay, 900 times 900 5 times kilograms. kilograms. Yes, yes. What is it? Is it 10,000 or 9,000? 9, 9,000. Okay, and then 900 times 5 kilograms. 4,500. 4,500 kilograms. Okay, so this is the yes, materials that are required to just meet the production level. And like we said, what if we already have some materials in the warehouse, which is opening inventory of materials? It will mean that what we'll require will be less by what you already have. So you see less opening inventory of material. So if it is, let's say, uh, 100 and this is also 100 and this is 100 all right then it will mean we will need less than what we have anticipated so 11,000 minus 100 will be 10,000 10,000 what 10,900, 900 and 9,600, this will be 9,500, 4,500, so this is 4,400. Don't even worry about the figures. Just understand the concepts. So when we subtract any opening inventory, we have to get this one. This is what we have to actually get ready for the production of the production budget. And again, because raw materials can also undergo wastage, some raw materials, especially if they are liquid, they can undergo what they call, um, they, they can lose some quantity over time. They can evaporate to reduce in quantity. Apart from that, if you are dealing with something like sugar, you get some spill offs. Some of them will fall in the on the ground, which you cannot use. There is always some normal wastage, some normal losses when you are dealing with materials. All right. And also because of what we said about production, there could be a surge in demand for the finished product, which we didn't capture in our sales estimation. So we make provisions for that by adding planned closing inventory. And that said, can also require that there should be more materials. So we also budget for a planned closing inventory just to meet any shortages coming from wastage and any extra requirement coming from a surge in demand. So we we'll do add Add planned 
closing inventory for both A, B, and C. So if that one is, let's say, 200, 200, 200, then when you add it to what we produced earlier, then that gives you the raw materials requirements budget. So that is the raw materials you require to meet the, the level of production that is estimated in the production budget. Are you okay? Who has a question yes, at this point in time? Any question? Any question? So this is a raw materials requirement budget. And when you get the price at which you will buy any, at which you will buy one unit of the raw materials and multiply it by the raw materials requirement, that gives you the raw materials purchase budget. So if you follow it up through your text, you will see it just as we have explained. Labor budget, very simple. Now, we know how much of the finished goods we have to produce. And we know how much of the materials that will be required to produce it. And how much money needs to be made available for the purchase of the materials. The materials cannot tend to finished goods by themselves. The conversion exercise is normally the job of the labor. Labor will not work for free. So we need to estimate how much labor time is required to meet the production. And how much cost that labor time is for us to find the money. So that's basically what the labor budget is. So if you have the number of units to be produced as in the production budget, then we need to estimate the hour per unit, hour for producing one unit of the product. That gives us the labor budget in hours. Labor budget in hours. If you take this example, so the production level is 6,000. Then each unit of the product requires eight hours to produce. So this is a production budget in hours. If you get a total production budget in hours, then we multiply it by the rates per hour, how much we pay labor for one hour. And that gives us the, gives us the labor budget. We get a total hours of labor time to meet the production, multiplied by the rate per hour, gives us the labor budget, which is the labor cost that we anticipate to incur. All right. So you follow the same ideology in the preparation of factory overhead budgets. in a class, please. Okay. So now we have been able to deal with sales budget, production budget, raw materials budget. And labor budget it is very well explained in your textbooks we want to shift our attention to cash budget it's one of the most important budgets that needs to be prepared 
cash budget. When we prepare, after preparing our sales budget, production budget, materials budget, labor budget, overhead budget, we can deduce our income statement budget. The income statement budget will, what will the income statement budget make us know? Ebenezer? Hey, it's not Ebenezer. Experienza. Afrakuma. Afrakuma. Shadrach, your hand was up. Okay, uh, Afrakuma is on. Afrakuma. Afrakuma is not ready to talk. Shadrach, your hand was, was up. If you want to talk, talk. The question is, we can deduce our budgeted income statement from all the budgets we have prepared so far. So when we prepare our budgeted income statement, what will that statement tell us? What is the bottom line in the income statement? Chadrak. Chadrak, your hand is up. Afrakuma, uh, okay, please. Chadrak, let's listen to you. Uh, I think the, the, the cash budget will let us know. Uh, I'm not saying cash budget. I don't know if you are paying attention. I said we can prepare the budgeted income statement from our sales budget, production budget, materials budget, labor budget, uh, oh, okay. overhead budget. And then it, when we prepare our income statement our budget, what will it show us? It will help us estimate our profits. Good. So if we know our profit, let's say based on all the budget we have prepared, the income statement budget is showing us that we will make a profit of 100,000 Ghana cities, or let's say 1 million Ghana cities. Isn't that enough information? Why should we, in addition to that, in addition to knowing our profit, also prepare cash budget? So in the first place, let me ask, what does the cash budget do for us? Maybe that will be a, a, a good first question before we come to the second one. What does the cash budget do for the business? Afrakuma. What does the cash budget do? Mike, if I join my online class, maybe this is here in my friend. Hello, class. It's a, it's a question to the whole class. What does the cash budget do? Shadrach, try. Uh, sir, please, I think the cash budget will help us know the amount of expenditure to pay or the total cost that we are supposed to pay to meet our expenses. Okay. When we prepare the materials budget, wouldn't the materials budget make us know the, the total amount to pay for materials? When we prepare the labor budget, wouldn't the labor budget make us understand how much we have to pay for labor. It's and we have already prepared this budget, so why they need to prepare the cash budget? It's a question to the whole class. The whole class is not only Shadrach. Yes, Dennis. Yes. yes. So to know the cost of raw materials and components that's needed for production. 
That will be produced by the raw materials budget and the components budget. Why should we prepare cash budget again? What does the cash budget do? If you're able to get it right, I'll give you five marks. I mean it. Sir, I, I want to try it. Yes, try it, please. Uh, please, it is used to show the the cash receipts and payments. It is used to show the cash receipts and payments. Receipt. So Good. the inflows and the outflows. Okay, to, that's to help us do what? So, so the um, the inflows and the outflows will help us um, know how much. For, for instance, the uh, inflows. The inflows is what, uh, what we are getting after we uh, from the sales, and the outflows too is what we are paying for production. Okay, that's that's a, a good attempt, but it, it will not merit a mark. Okay. Okay. When does someone want to talk? When we have, yes, Dennis. So, uh, the cash budget is prepared to show the expected receipt of cash and payment. Which helps us to do what? Yes, it shows that. And when it shows that, how does that help us? It helps us to plan for the future. Okay, you are doing prepare, well. Prepare for the future. Yes, but I can't give you a mark. I am the quiz master. Yes, sir. Okay, good attempt. Give me so this is, what, <laughs> this is what the cash budget helps us yes, to do. Benedict, you want to talk? Um, Benedict, your, your, your talking is very low. Can you raise your voice a bit? Bene, can you raise your voice a little? I'm coming. And it helps to determine whether we have sufficient. Okay. Bene, you are, you are on course. Ooh. You are very well on course, but I can't hear it. And the whole of the, the meeting members need to understand they need to hear what you are saying to get their understanding you are teaching us so please um uh, amplify your voice right so can you hear me now i can hear you but it's very Hello? faint very okay. faint can you do something about your your voice okay, Coming. I was like, it helps in um, the cash budget helps in estimating cash inflows and outflows over a specific period of time, and then it helps to determine whether we have sufficient cash to continue operating over a given period of time. Okay, I think I have to give you some marks. All right, I will not give you the four five marks. I'll give you part of the five, so you can see me for your marks. That's good. So let me just add some, something. Tamara, you want to speak? I want to try if it's correct. No, we are all trying. What I'm speaking, I'm trying. OK, so be always prepared to talk. OK, say, so I can say that the cash budget, it ensures smooth operations in the organization. How? The how okay. is the most important thing? The, I think it can help to, let's say, put things in order to avoid future crisis. Put okay. things, things in order in the organization to avoid future problems or crises that will arise. Exactly. So let's see exactly how it will help us to do that. I'm going to add what Tamara has said right now to what Benedicta said. Add something small to it and they will get to understand the benefits of the cash budget. 
in business we have something we call cash flow have you heard of cash flow before cash flow yes please okay yes please yes yeah what is a cash flow dennis you have heard cash flow before what is it yes dennis what is a cash flow to you Shadrach, can you say something sure. about what a cash flow is? Yes, please. Uh, a cash flow uh, shows the cash inflows, so the cash coming into the business and cash going out the firm. Okay. So, so cash coming into the business is a cash flow. Specifically, it is a cash inflow. Cash in flow, cash coming in. Cash going out of the business is specifically called cash outflow. So let me reword the question. What is not a cash flow? Tamara. Mm, cash not coming into the business. <laughs> Sorry. So, so some of some of uh some questions you can better answer them by example especially this question i asked i mean it's very difficult for you for you to use words to explain and that was what tomorrow was trying to do so you can explain it with example uh, yes denise uh, for example like can i say depreciation are you asking me? You can say whatever you want to say. So just say it. Don't ask me, can you say it? <laughs> the depreciation. Good. Depreciation. Depreciation is not a cash flow. But on the income okay. statement, it is charged as an expense, isn't it? Yes, sir. So this is what cash flow is. And this is what cash flow is not. Cash flow is any item that results in explicit, explicit in capital letters, explicit receipt or payment in cash, payment of cash. I'm saying it again. Any item that results in explicit receipt of cash or explicit payment of cash is what we describe as cash flow. Explicit here means there's physical receipt of cash or physical payment of cash. So that when we say this is a cash flow and it is a cash inflow, we will actually receive cash from somewhere. If it is a cash outflow, we stuff. will definitely pay cash out of the business, either through our bank or through our our safe or by exchanging with some assets. It will definitely result in a physical outflow of resources or physical inflow of resources. That is cash flow. There are some things that we may recognize in the income statement as income but they will never translate into an explicit receipt of cash. There are some other things that we will capture on the income statement as expenditure, but they will never result in any physical payment of cash. And then it gave us one example as depreciation. Depreciation on the income statement will be subtracted from the revenue for us to arrive finally at our profit. But when we ask you that show the receipt for the depreciation charge, we never paid money to anybody, did we? We don't pay money to anybody, but yet depreciation is an expense. Unlike wages, which is also an expense. Wages is, a, is, is, is an actual or 
explicit payment of money to workers. And that is a cash flow. Okay. So with that understanding, this is what a cash budget does for us. When we prepare our income statement, which shows us our profits, the profit will not automatically be our cash. Because of what we have said, depreciation is there. There will be some gains that will record as income, but they are never going to be any money that we will receive. So the cash that we will receive that we can use to pay may be different from what the profit figure is. And we need to know what the cash is. The cash is the lifeblood of the company. Profit can be very big, only to realize that the cash associated with it is very small. Apart from that, <clears throat> there is timing to when cash will be received. When we sell, whether on cash or on, on cash basis or on credit, we record them as sales revenue. In the income statement, the sales revenue figure you see there, almost all of them can be on credit. And from business practice, customers take time to pay. Some may pay a portion of it immediately, spread the remaining over some time. Which means that at any point in time, the cash that may be available is different from the sales you have generated. You can make a lot of sales, but these sales may not be cash. So some companies report very big sales revenue, very big profit, but they still don't have cash to pay workers. They have serious cash flow problems because profit is not cash. That's the summary of it. At least when you sell, let's say when you sell goods in January, and you have a credit policy of three months. January, February, you have no money from the sales you have made. You have no money from the sales you have made. Yet, your profit will capture the whole of the sales. But you don't have cash. So the cash budget tries to track the actual receipt of money and actual payment for us to know our cash position. Because it is cash that we need to pay. Everything is no profit. Have you understood it? Yes, sir. James Agama. James, we don't need to see your face for sir. anything. Put your camera, your, your camera off, please. James Agama, okay, your sir. camera should be off. Okay, sir. All right. So because, because of the fact that there could be a difference in period, between when we sell and when customers pay. Because of the fact that not all items on the income statement are cash flows, we cannot take certain decisions, especially cash-based decisions with the profit statement. That is why we need a separate statement to give us a specific picture of the company's cash position, and that is the cash budget. So the cash budget. Sandra, uh, please, please, your microphone should be off. So the cash budget helps us to know when cash is coming in, at what time, at what amount, so that at each period we can know how much cash is available, how much cash we actually need, what is the difference? Is the difference a deficit? If we get to know that the difference is a deficit, then we can talk to our bankers or arrange credit from somewhere to support the business operations. If the difference is a surplus and the surplus is too big, we can now plan that we have to invest the extra surplus to make some returns. We cannot keep the cash idle. And all of these things help in your, in your business management for you to be a profitable company. So that's why we need a cash budget in addition to all the other statements. Any questions so far before we tackle cash budgets?
What's that? It's so. Any question? Okay, so cash budgets. Let's look at the format for the cash budgets. These are the major sections of the cash budget. Receipt of cash from whatever sources. All of them will be tracked across the different periods. So let's say January, February, March. Then when we get a total receipt of cash, we now look at our expenditure, which will require payment with cash. So disbursement. Disbursement. So all items of disbursement need to be captured. But the only difficulty with cash budget, otherwise it's very simple exercise, is that you should be able to, what I'm saying is not even a difficulty, you should be able to track the timing of the cash flows. For example, if the receipts are in the form of sales revenue, and you look at the pattern of collecting money from receivables, you will know that maybe for any given sales for a period, part will be received in the same month of sale. Then some portion will be received the following month. Some portions will be received two months earlier and so on and so forth. Companies sometimes even have a policy of um, provision for doubtful debt. So they can say that, okay, from their business, uh, from the track record of what they see in their business, about 2% of receivables will not be will not be collected they will go bad so you, you need to understand all of these things these are the only issues that can bother you otherwise it's a very simple exercise so we'll take an example and work through them and then you can begin to see how it is so in the meantime just know the main block sections of the cash budget so we have disbursement then we tally all the disbursements then we total the disbursement, just as we have totaled the receipts. Then we subtract the disbursement from the receipts, which will give us a dis I mean, surplus situation or a deficit situation. Then, if we have any opening cash balance that we began the period with, we add it to the deficit or surplus, which gives us the closing cash position. Losing cash positions. There could be some other issues inside there. Some companies will have a policy of minimum cash balance. So that at any point in time, the company's cash balance should be a certain figure. So when your closing balance is not up to that, you either have to go and borrow. If it is more than that, you have to maybe invest the surplus so that at any point in time, it has to be at just the minimum cash balance position. We'll take an example. There are a lot of examples in your text that illustrate those things. So let's take one example. Example one from your textbook on page 328. So let's follow through it. Okay, so this is the, the format. Let's take this example. ABC company wished to arrange overdraft facility with its bankers during the period April 2020 to June 2020, when it will be manufacturing mostly for the stock. 
prepare a cash budget for the above period from the following data, indicating the extent of the bank facility the company will require. In effect, what this question is asking is that prepare a cash budget which will show the cash positions of the position of the company at various time periods and whether the cash positions reveal that the company should borrow or the company should not borrow. Because this is a planning tool, it gives you an insight. So this is the information we have. Sales for January, it sells for February. So this, this figure should be, should be 2019, sorry. February 2019, 180,000. March 2020, 192,000. April 108,000. May 174,000. June 126,000. Purchases for these same periods are also given. Wages are also given. Additional information. 50% of credit sales are realized in the month following the sale and remaining 50% in the second month following. Payables are paid in the month following the month of purchase. There are no cash sales or cash purchases. Cash at bank. Estimated on 1st April 2019, I changed the figure, so this should be 2019. 2019 is 25,000 Ghana cities. So we have to prepare cash budgets. So this is what we just have to do. So sometimes for you to get things straightforward and very accurate, you need to break the preparation of the cash budget into several schedules. So you can prepare. Receivables collection. Schedule. You know, when, when people come and buy, they pay according to a certain pattern. So we want to use that pattern to track when monies will be received from your mic. Okay, let's go. So you will prepare receivables collection schedule. Then you will also prepare payables payment schedule. Then lastly, you prepare the cash budget itself. So you see that the cash budget will be like the lead schedule. And this will be like the supporting schedules. This is a better way of preparing the cash budget than lumping all the figures in one shadow. Okay, so from this simple illustration, let's see what will happen. The question said 50% um, from the sales information we have, 50% of the sales are realized in the amount of sale. So receivables, collection shadow. We have the, the questions that we should prepare a budget for April, May, and June. So April, May, June. We have sales. All of the sales were credit sales. So when you write sales, it makes sense. Or you can just make it very emphatic, credit sales. 
So sales in the receivable collection schedule, actually it has to be credit sales. So the sales figures were for January, okay, April. We can have March here. March sales was nine one nine two one nine two thousand april sales was one zero eight thousand may is one seventy four thousand june is one twenty six thousand okay so these are the sales made in each of the months. But when customers are paying, so I will not actually need this. I just put them here so I will refer to them. So the question is saying that when we sell, 50% is received in the following month. So all the month, the max month sales, 50% will be received in April. And the remaining 50% will be received in May. That of April also follows the same pattern. So you now have to come and show the timing of receiving the cash flows. So I'll write here uh, one month, one month after sale. That is 50%. So the sales in March. 50% will be received in April. What is 50% of 192? 192,000. 192, it's a question to the class, please. I need your response. 50% of 192,000. Nine please come again. 10,600. 10,600. Like this one. Is, is the figure correct? 10,600. 10, 50% of 9,600. 9,000. 9,000. Okay. Thank you. 9,600. Then. Yes. We can come and write two months after sale. That is also 50%. That, so the same month of March, the remaining 50% will be received two months after the sale, which will fall in May. So that will be 9,600, all right? So we are done with um, March. When we come to April, April, April sales, gross sales was 108,000, 108,000. 50% of this 108,000 will be received in the following month, which is May. So what is 50% of May's salary, May's uh, sales? 50% is how much? Yeah, 54,000. 54,000. 54, and the remaining the remaining 50% yes, will go to June, which is another 54,000. When we come to May, 50% of 174,000 will be received in June. What is 50% of 174,000? Eighty-seven thousand. Eighty-seven thousand. And the remaining fifty percent will be received yeah. in July. So we could have brought July, but because July falls outside of the period, the question is asking us to prepare the budget. You can forget about it. But ideally, we should have brought July to put the figure there. Okay. So this is the timing of receipt of 
okay, so the yeah. cash from the receivables. So when we do totaling, so here, this will be 9,600. But remember, remember, we have we are making a slight mistake. Um, sales in February. Sales in February. Okay, so the February day, all of them will be 2020. That change I made, you know, you, you have to correct it. The 2018 day should not be there. They are all for 2020. So February, if you had brought February here, because February will come and affect April. The month that the question is asking us to concentrate on is the April to June. The timing of receipt of money for February, March will come into April. So February should have considered. February sales was 180,000. 50% will be received in March. What is 50% of it? 50% of 180,000. Nine thousand. What? Hello. Nine thousand. Hey. Fifty percent of one eighty thousand is nine thousand. Ninety. Ninety or 90, nine thousand. Ninety thousand. Okay. Ninety. Ninety thousand. Ninety thousand. And then you told me 50% of 192,000 is 9,600. Yeah, of April. April is 9,600. It's 9,600. That is correct. Eh? For April. Yes, there. Isn't that one? Is it not 96,000? So how do you do your calculations, please? 50% of 192,000. You told me it is 9,600. 96,000. Hmm. So calculations of you cannot do. Sorry, sir. That is dangerous for you. 96,000. So this will also be 96,000. 50% of, check that one, 50% of 108,000. That one is a 54,000. Check. 54,000, yes. Okay, so we have made the corrections. So 50% of February will be yes. received in March, which is 90,000. And the remaining 50% will be received in April. So here in April, there should have been 90,000 here. So we should have considered the February sales because part of the receipt will fall into the months that we are considering. So once that uh, adjustment has been done, the total receipt of money from receivables in April will be 90,000 plus 96,000. What would that figure be? $90,000 plus 96,000. Quick. 186,000. 186,000. Then for the month of May. 186,000. For the month of May, yes, the sir. total receipt of cash from receivables will be 54,000 plus 96,000. What would that be? 150,000. 150,000. 
for the month of June, the total receipt of cash from receivables, from receivables will be I'm coming, let me write this figure. For June, it will be eighty-seven thousand plus fifty-four thousand. What would that be? What would that figure be? Eighty-seven thousand plus fifty-four thousand. Hello. One forty-one thousand. So are you are you not able to talk? So this is the amount one forty one thousand amount collectible from receivables. So this is the receivables collection schedule. So it is able to tell us for every month how much we'll receive. We will actually receive as cash from our receivables so that that would be that could be schedule one then payables payment schedule that could be schedule two that one too is about our payables those that we have bought goods from if we take the months of February, March, April, May, June, the gross purchases in the question were, and once we have these purchases in the payment, payables payment, it means these are all credit purchases. Cash purchases, you would have paid for them already. So there is no need to track how you are going to pay. You just pick the figures as you pay them. So here, these are the purchases we made, credit purchases. February was 128, 124, sorry. 124,000. March was 144,000. April, 243,000. May was 246. And June, 268. So these, these are the gross purchases. I'm just bringing these figures here as reference. And the question said, payables, payables are paid in the month following the month of purchases. That's the pattern of our payment to payables, which means that The actual payment for February's purchases, there will be the payment will be made in March 124. For March purchases, the payment will be made in April 144,000. For April's purchases, the payment will be made in May 243,000. For May's purchases, the payment will be made in June, 246K. And for June's purchases, the payment will be made in July. So this brings you to the end of the payables payment schedule. And there are other payments like wages. That is not part of pay, I mean, you can add it to the payables payment schedule, but when we say 
maybe you prepare this payables payment schedule exclusively for your trade payables. It is usually a good thing to separate in accounting, we call it classification, to classify things properly. Trade payables are different from other payables. Trade payables are your creditors in terms of buying goods on credit. The goods are the things you buy and sell. But other people you owe may, may not be trade payables. They may be other payables. But for this particular question that we had only one other item of payment, wages. We can add the wages to the payables payment schedule. Wages, the question did not say anything about the timing of payment of wages. It means that wages are paid in the same month as they are incurred. So wages, so we can call this one trade payables. Yeah, just to make it more informative, trade payables. That's the purchases. And then wages. Wages in the same month, we pay them. So February was 12,000. March was 14,000, 11,000, 10,000, 15,000. So now we have to tally for the amount of interest, or you can even do for all of them and then pick the amount of interest. The total payment that will be made in the month February will be 12,000. 12,000. I mean, per the information we have, the total will be 12,000. For March, it will be 124,000 plus 14,000. What, what would that figure be? 124,000 plus 14,000. What is it? I'm asking you, please. Are you dozing off? 138,000. 138,000. Thank you, Dennis. 138,000. 138. 138,000. For April, it will be 144,000 plus 11,000. What would that be? 144,000 plus 11,000. What would that figure be? 150. 155,000. 155,000. For May, it will be 240. 55,000. May will be 243,000 plus 10,000. 243,000 plus 10,000. What is the figure? 253,000. 253,000. 253,000. June will be 246,000 plus 15,000. 53,000. June will be 246,000. Plus fifteen thousand. What is the sum? Fifteen thousand plus fifteen thousand. Two hundred and sixty-one thousand. Two hundred and sixty-one. Two hundred and sixty-one. Two hundred and sixty-one. This is the thousand payables payment schedule. Now that we have finished with the supporting schedules we now can come and prepare the cash budget and the cash budget the question says we should be prepared for april may and june that's second quarter so we have receipt of cash in june. Yes. receipt of cash so we go to the there was no cash. Remember, there was no cash sales. If there were 
any cash sales would have brought cash sales here as one of the things that is going under receipt of cash. So cash sales. For this particular ca question, cash sales is zero for all the periods. Then collection from collections from receivables. Then we refer to the receivables collection schedule. April was 186,000. We just go and put it there. So if we're, if you are using this one, the best tool that we use to prepare budget is spreadsheet. So if we're using spreadsheet, you just go and link that cell to here. It will bring the figure there straight up. You do not have to type them yourself. What was it? 186,000. 186,000. That for May, May was 150,000. 150,000. And for May, it's 150,000. 150,000. 150, okay. Yes, sir. So this is all the source of receipt of cash. So we can say total cash receipts 186000 so cash budget continued then we come to payments or disbursements Then that one, we had payment to payables because we lumped all of them into the payables payment schedule. So payments to payables. I'm lost. You are lost? Yes, sir. I'll come back. Payment to payables. So... I mean, in practice, you can do into bracket, maybe schedule two, schedule two, so that anybody who is reading will know where you are picking these figures from. Schedule two was the payables payment schedule. Payables payment schedule, the total for April was 155,000. 155,000. So April, May, June. This is one five five thousand. That for May was two hundred and fifty five thousand. Two hundred and fifty three thousand. Two hundred and fifty three thousand. And June was two hundred and sixty-one thousand. Two hundred and sixty-one thousand. Good. Two hundred and sixty-one thousand. And June is okay. So this is all the items of payment. We have put them together in the payable one thousand. So we can do total disbursement. One five five thousand, two five three thousand, two six one thousand. I'm doing it this way because in some question the items of disbursement may be more than one item, so you come and do the sum of them to get a total. Now we do surplus. You have to calculate surplus or deficits. The deficits will be put in parentheses. That's what we do in accounting. And it is the cash receipt minus the disbursement. Cash receipt for April was 186,000. 
186,000 minus 155,000. What is the figure? 186 minus 155. Thirty-one thousand. Thirty-one thousand. So that is a surplus of income over over mm. payment. Let's do it for May. Receipt total receipt of cash for May was one fifty thousand. One fifty thousand minus two hundred and fifty-three thousand. What was the figure? One fifty thousand minus two hundred and fifty three thousand. Okay. It's a deficit of one zero three thousand. If we come to June, one oh three thousand. Good. If you come to June, total receipt of cash of one forty one thousand minus payments of two six one thousand. What will that be? One forty one thousand minus two sixty one thousand. One twenty thousand. One twenty thousand deficit. So just by this tells you that for the second quarter, April, May, June. This is our yes, cash yes. position for each of the months. For April, we'll have a surplus cash of 31,000. But for both May and June, the kind of things we may have to pay for, the money that will be available cannot pay for them. There'll be a shortage of 103,000 in May and a shortage of cash of 120,000 in June. And this revelation helps you to plan for money. You have to go and talk to your banks for overdrafts or sell some assets that you think are not needed to raise the money to meet this requirement. And if you were sitting down without doing this kind of planning, how would you have noticed that February you will, you will be sh short of cash by this amount? And June, sorry, May and June, you'll be short of cash by, by these amounts. That's why it is good to do, good. Then let's continue the question. The question said, cash at bank, at first April, forget about the 2018, I changed the date, so all of them should be 2020. Cash at bank at first April was 25,000. The overdraft there means they actually have that balance by taking overdraft from the bank. So, so the overdraft is in effect a negative balance, right? What do you think of the overdraft? In the first place, let's let's. I mean, discuss what overdraft is. What is an overdraft? I have still five students in class. What is overdraft? Tamara, what is overdraft for you? Tamara. Hey. What do you understand by overdraft? Overdraft, something that has been drafted. Hey, no, so I'm coming. So I'm not too sure of what I have in mind. So I'm coming. Okay, Benedicta. Benedicta. Dennis. How do you understand overdraft, Dennis?
Yes, man. Yes. Say something about overdraft. Overdraft. It's like it's like you were drawing you were drawing money even though like you have no funds in your account. Like over you are drawing more money from your account, but you, you don't have that amount in your okay. account. Okay. So in effect, overdraft is like negative balance on your account, isn't it? Say. Yes, overdraft is like a negative balance on your account. You have yes, sir. drawn all your money to zero, and you have even withdrawn beyond zero. So you are owing the bank. So that balance will be a negative balance. Okay, which means that you need to go and make some adjustments to this solution. The solution they provided here shows they treated the overdraft as a positive balance, but that should be negative. That if you treat it negative, that is more correct than if you treat it positive. So it's a negative balance on the company's account on April 1st. So if you go back here, you see that this is the cash positions. But beginning April, beginning April, so you will have opening cash balance. Beginning April, there was a deficit of, or we had overdrawn our account by 25,000, which is negative. Okay, so now if you add the beginning cash balance of negative 25,000 to April's surplus of 31,000, what would we have? What would we have? 56,000. So that would be our closing cash balance. 56,000. 56,000. And this 56,000, all right, that is closing April, isn't it? Then it will become the beginning for May. It will become the beginning for May. Do you understand that? This 56,000 is the closing balance. Let's go back. The beginning yes, cash balance for beginning cash balance for April was the negative 25,000. When we add it to its surplus, we'll get the closing mm -hmm. cash balance for April. Then the closing cash balance for April serves as the beginning cash balance for May. So 56,000 as the beginning ca opening cash balance for May. 56,000. Now, if you add this 56,000 positive to the deficit of 103,000, what would it be? Beginning cash balance from April of positive 56,000. And then for May itself, there will be a, a deficit of 103,000. When you add the two figures, what would you get? Negative 47,000. 47,000. 47,000. So that will be the closing cash balance. For Negative, yeah, the deficit of 47,000. Good. And this balance will now go and serve as the beginning cash balance for June. So this will be deficit of 47,000. So this 47,000, negative 47,000, sorry, when added to the already existing deficit of 120,000, what will be the closing cash balance? 120,000 plus 47,000. You get a deficit of 167,000. Negative. A deficit yes. of so 167,000. 
So that is the end of the cash budget for this particular question. That is what cash budget is. So this cash budget has helped us to know that for the month of April, we will have a cash position of 56,000 positive. May, a deficit of 47,000. June, a deficit of 167,000. So even for April that we have positive, it means we'll have cash available to support all the operations in April. But there are some other considerations like some companies will always want to make some minimum cash balance. They want to make sure at any point in time there is some cash balance in there. There's some amount of cash balance in their bank account. So you may have to compare this to that minimum requirement. If it doesn't meet, if, let's say if the minimum requirement is more than this, then you may have to go, go for overdraft or a loan to top it up to make it meet the minimum balance. You do it for all of them. For this particular question, that complication is not part of it. So this becomes the end of this question. All right. So this position tells us that the company needs to go and find money at least, at least for May, 47,000, at least for June, 167,000 Ghana cities. That can support the operations in the respective months. Okay. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? Okay, if there are no questions, this is where we'll end the lecture. Um, I will upload this video for you to go over it to kind of get the understanding. Then you have to help yourself by going through examples two examples three and i'll also ask the ta to come and help you uh, maybe with some face-to-face -face regarding this budgeting and the cost volume profit analysis the cost volume profit analysis lecture was done yesterday the videos are already uploaded with all supporting materials they are there your test books has it's well treated the video will give you added explanations to the content of the textbook. Add the two, and you, you will be able to pass very well. Same thing applies to this topic, budgeting. What is left with budgeting is that I'll try to do a video tutorial, short one. Or maybe it's not a tutorial. It will be like an added lecture on how we employ spreadsheets to do this budgeting. And I will end it. So for now, you can take it as ended, waiting for the spreadsheet application of the same thing. Thank you very much for your attention. You're welcome.